Broadcasting live from the Treehouse in Phoenix, Arizona. It's Not Conscious. With Mark Poles and Chris Woodsy Peralta. From the home offices in Gilbert, Arizona. Welcome to Not Conscious. Chris, how are you doing today, sir? Good, Mark. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Today is a very special treat for us. Very much so. We have a gentleman named Charles Thompson. And Chris, tell us about Charles. What, what do you remember about Charles? It's so awesome. Uh, I know Charles originally from Square One, the Michael Jackson documentary. And then I uh, investigator from the UK. Then I recently became aware of the Unfinished podcast about the Shoebury uh, UK um, child pedophilia ring, which was an amazing eight eight or nine part podcast. So that's how I know Charles. Yeah, it's eight episodes and a bonus, I think is what it was. It was uh, it was amazing. It was really good to hear and listen yeah. to the way it was laid out. So Charles, welcome to Knocked Conscious. Uh, you're on with Chris and Mark. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're so happy to have you on. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a journalist and a little bit of your backstory. Sure. So um, I'm in England um, and I'm 32 now and I became a professional journalist. I started getting paid when I was about 19. Um, I always wanted to be a journalist and people always ask me why and I don't know uh, is the truthful answer. I just can't remember. Um, it's possibly because when I was a kid, I used to love Superman and I used to watch those um, adventures of Clark Kent, the Lois Lane things. Uh, I don't know if you remember the TV series with uh, Dean Cain. Yeah, of course. Terry Hatcher. Of course. Um, you can forget Terry Hatcher, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> it may stem from that. Uh, I don't really remember why I wanted to be a journalist. And to be honest, once I started studying, it was so different than what I thought it would be as well. Um, I was extremely shy when I was a kid and um, even, you know, when I was a teenager. And my first ever journalism studies lecture at university, the lecturer gave us all a notepad and a pen and said, right, your mission today is you've got to go out into the high street and interview people. And I just was like, oh my God, this sounds like the worst thing you could possibly have said to me because I was so shy. Um, I just thought journalism was like writing things. But of course it's not, because when you think about it, if you're writing journalism, then you don't just sit down at a computer and, and write something, because what are you going to write? You need to know what's going on. So when you think about it, it's really obvious that you know, in, ter in terms of what journalism is, it should be about going off and talking to people and finding things out. But it is, you don't realize that until you start doing it. And so in the beginning, I was quite horrified by the idea of, uh, you know, just having to like cold call people or walk up to people in the street and talk to them. But, you know, now it's like, it's been my job for, you know, over a decade. And um, I started out in show business journalism and music journalism. Um, I started freelancing when I was still studying at university. And after I finished university, I graduated into the recession after the global financial collapse. And it was very difficult to get an entry level job in journalism. And um, so I just kept freelancing, doing showbiz reporting. And I was doing lots of stuff on Michael Jackson. I was doing uh, music reporting on like soul music and funk music, selling interviews to magazines and uh and doing court reporting and other bits of showbiz reporting i did amy winehouse stories for a while and things like that and um just gradually got disillusioned with it and uh eventually ended up moving into the regional press and that's what i've been doing ever since really i've uh been working in regional newspapers in and around london since 2011. that's excellent well, welcome. We are so happy to have you on here. Um, tell, would you like to share some of the big musical names that you work with besides Michael Jackson? I know you did an expose with another pretty famous soul R&B singer as well. I, uh, let's try and remember from the beginning. So my first was, um, my first sort of assignment was James Brown. So I started university in 2006, September 2006. And in October 2006, um, because I was a huge James Brown fan, I decided to use my sort of 
quote unquote credentials as a student journalist to try to get to meet him. And uh, I managed to sort of finagle my way into his press conference at his London concert. Turned out to be the last concert he ever did in uh, in London. And um, I got to ask him a question. Uh, I didn't get his autograph. I got very close. I was just about to get his autograph. And some kids ran up to him. And I thought, oh, I'll let them go first. Because otherwise I'll look like an asshole. And, um, and so they got his autograph. And then his security grabbed him and put him in an elevator. And he was gone. I was like, oh, shit. So that's, you know gutting but um i got to talk to him and i was at that concert his last ever concert and it was a really strange experience because um james brown was a very sort of braggadocious kind of person and uh uh very confident and bullish and often um you know sort of overly confident you know he used to tell crazy stories about his life that were clearly not true um, to sort of like, he used to tell people that he once played a concert to a million people, which is clearly not true. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, but in this press conference, he was really morbid. I asked him a question, um, which was what's happened to your new album? Cause a few years earlier, he'd been recording a new album and then just nothing happened. And I asked him this question and the whole tone of the press conference just changed. And he got really morbid and then said, um, somebody's going to have to die before that album comes out. And I'm not going to say anything else other than that. And, um, and then, but then he started talking again and he said, we'd love to get it out, but we need help. And as he said, we need help. His voice cracked, like he was going to start crying. And then his manager interjected and said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, but, uh, if there's any news about the album, we'll, we'll put out a press release or something like that. But it was a really weird moment from him. Uh, totally out of character and um, I found it a bit weird and of course about six weeks later he was dead and uh, it was so weird because that was the words he said to me was somebody's gonna have to die before that album comes out and then six weeks later he's dead um, it was just really creepy uh, this seemed weird it's crazy and the album never came out anyway I don't know I think it was unusable because I did end up doing a big story um, I'm trying to remember what it was called. I think it was just called The Lost Album, James Brown, The Lost Album. Um, I did a big story yeah. on it where I went off and interviewed yeah. lots of his band members that worked with him on the album. And they were all just talking about, you know, basically he was in a dispute with his management and he was really eager to record this album. And then by the time they actually got into the studio to record it. He'd sort of gone off the idea and he was cheesed off with his management. And so what they ended up with was just a lot of old crap, really, you know, like one or two good songs and then a lot of like cover versions and right. weird, weird things. Um, I wonder if it was like a contractual issue because I remember like the whole Billy Joel piano man thing. The reason he was in that bar playing was because he was had a contractual dispute with his current, uh, you know, a and R people or whatever the music company was. Well, I subsequently found out through an interview with his wife uh, a few years after he died, about five years after he died, I interviewed his widow, Tommy Ray. And um, she was telling me about how around that period where I had that press conference with him and he started almost crying. She was saying that he was making strange comments to her. Like, you know, I've, I've, I'm like, he's a slave and he's in servitude and these people own him and they're controlling him and he can't do anything that he wants to do. And, um, when he died, uh, his wife was not in the house. She was away and she returned and the, the money men, the managers had padlocked her out of the house. They put like 10 padlocks on the gate to the house so she couldn't get in. And, um, she told me all sorts of stuff about threats that were made to her and, and, you know, the dispute over his estate is still going on right now. Um, he died in 2006 and his estate has still not been settled. Where are we now? 2021. His estate has not been settled. Um, so his ex-wife is still trying to get that all worked out? Yeah. So woman? what happened was it turned out some of these businessmen that she named to me, well, at least one of them got prosecuted after he died. It turned out he had been embezzling money. His name was David Cannon. 
he'd been embezzling money from Mr. Brown's estate and ended up um, taking some sort of plea deal and serving a sentence under house arrest. And then there were others that they were unhappy with, but they never got prosecuted. And unfortunately, when Mr. Brown died, he left a will which was out of date. I think the will had been signed in about 1998. And um, so it predated the marriage and it predated the birth of their son. So um, effectively, it ended up in a big dispute where certain members of the family were trying to stop the new wife and the new child from getting, in, you know, getting a share of the estate. And um, when they finally settled all the stuff between the family members, then the the bank or the court had it, had put in place some temporary executors. And the executors started saying, well, now we want to cut because we've been running the estate for so long, for like five years or whatever it is. We want a cut now. And so then they all ended up going to court against the executor. It was just a massive, I don't think he's even been buried yet. I think it's not even been resolved, the issue of where and when he should be buried. So he's still in a crypt somewhere. Still now, to this day, 13 years later? I believe so, yeah. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Wow. I think it's more than 13 years. I think yeah. it's 15 years. What year was it? 06, right? 06? Oh, 15 years. Oh, well, 14, 15 years. Yeah. It was Christmas Day 2006, so we're just, we've just passed 14 years, I think. Wow. Well, I'm sorry that you never had that opportunity to have to get his autograph that for yourself <laughs> personal autograph. But, yeah, uh, yeah I, that's you know, I saw him live quite a few times and um, and he just was like so dynamic, even in old age. You know, the first time I saw him, I think he was 71. And you would have if someone had told you he was 50, you would have believed it. I mean, he was doing the running man. He was like spinning around doing robot moves and gliding all over the stage it was unbelievable um, he was definitely a showman the last time i saw him he was clearly not well um very very weak could barely move his legs his voice was very weak and um a few weeks later as i say died of uh, uh congestive heart failure but i believe he was admitted to hospital with pneumonia um and when they got him to the hospital they realized he was in heart failure and he died, although there was a fantastic piece of journalism that came out a few years ago. I'm sure the guy is called Thomas Lake. That sounds familiar. It was for CNN. A huge three piece, three article series um, investigating, reinvestigating the death of James Brown, which led to prosecutors saying that they were going to investigate whether he may have actually been murdered. Um, if you get a chance, it's a really long read, but it's a fantastic piece of journalism. I could, like long reads, so I have no problem with that. Could you share that uh, title again, please? I can't remember what it was called, but I think okay. the guy that wrote it was called Thomas Lake, and it was for Thomas CNN. Lake, huh? Yeah, we'll have to look that up. Chris is an avid reader. I'm an audiobook person myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was a very interesting piece. It was um, It was a long read, but what they also did was inserted lots of audio clips, documents you could download. So it was almost like you could follow the investigation yourself, looking at all the different pieces of evidence. It was a fantastic thing that they put together. It should have won a Pulitzer or something. I don't know if it got nominated for anything. That's like a choose your own adventure almost, like very interactive. Exactly. Of... I was just going to say that, yeah. Peace. That's neat. Uh, do, you mind, do you mind if I ask about any, any coverage that you had with Amy Winehouse? Yeah, I didn't do a lot on Amy Winehouse. So what happened was I got involved with a tabloid in the UK called The Sun um, through Michael Jackson stuff because um, I was quite well connected in the Michael Jackson world because before I became a professional journalist, I was working sort of um, on spec. I was doing uh, like music journalism for music fan sites and things to get bylines to build up a like a, a portfolio of work and um, so through that I had built up some good connections in the Michael Jackson world and so I actually broke the story or I helped to break the story when he announced um, the This Is It concerts in 2009 I got a call from somebody on the inside who said he's on 
whatever the flight was, it's landing at this airstrip at this time, um, you know, do something with that information. So uh, I sold that to the sun, basically. I, I worked with the sun and they got the exclusive pictures of him disembarking the plane. We were the only people that knew it was coming. And uh, I'd done that on the, you know, at the request of somebody in his camp. They had rung me and, and basically asked me to leak it. And um, from then on, I, you know, I was at the announcement at the O2 when he came out and announced the concerts. And then I became a, a sort of like a, a go-to guy for The Sun on anything Michael Jackson. And after I built up a relationship with The Sun, I started working on other stories. So I, I did some stuff on Amy Winehouse. I did some stuff on uh, Ronan Keating. I did uh, various bits and pieces. Ronan Keating, you probably have never heard of Ronan Keating, but he was in a big boy band here in the UK called Boyzone. Um, Winehouse, I've heard of I him, but I'm, I don't follow him. The I only <laughs> thing I remember doing on Amy Winehouse was about a bust up that she had with her dad. Um, and even then it was not a big piece of work. It was like an hour's work or something. Um, it was very strange the way the sun operated, you know, I might not hear from them for two months and they would ring me up and say, can you do X? I, one of the, well, like with the Ronan Keating thing, it was that, um, so he had been, um, making money, a lot of money from advertising deals. And the advertising was all based around him and his family. Uh, I can't remember what they were advertising, but it was all to do with, you know, some sort of like broadband TV malarkey or something. And so he was, it was all about him being this amazing family man. And look at me and my family. If you want to be like us, you should get this TV. And right. um, it turned out that he actually was cheating on his wife and it all was not quite what it seemed. Um, and they wanted me to try and find the girlfriend, which I did. Um, I won't go into too much detail about how that all came about, but that was my job on the Ronan Keating story was to find the girlfriend. But you actually were able to do so. That's amazing. I did. I did find her. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, That's it was good not him. Really good for you. Not so good for him. Right. Well, you know, it's not the kind of stuff I really wanted to be working on. Um, and I, I understand that it is in the public interest if somebody is making, you know, potentially like millions of pounds out of falsely portraying themselves as a fantastic family man when in fact they're cheating on their wife, then that is, you know, is a matter of public interest. But at the same what time, say, say again. I would certainly agree with that. I mean, it, it is a matter. Like, I would like to know if I'm being, you know, bamboozled, right? In a weird way. Yeah, it's. I think that the the point at which it becomes public interest is when you start roping the public in. So, if you're somebody who's in a band and you just go on stage and sing, and then you come off stage and you have your private life, then there's no public interest if you're cheating on your wife. You know, it's not in the public interest. But if you are profiting from portraying yourself as a really devoted, fantastic family man, then that that's different. Um, so in I, there was a public interest in it, but nonetheless, it was not something I was particularly interested in and not the kind of thing I got into journalism for. And yeah, I just what did slowly... that lead to? How, what did, what did that, uh, that expose lead to for you? Did that open any other doors or avenues for anything? Um, no, I just had an existing relationship with the son. And so they would contact me occasionally and say, can you do X, Y, Z? And I would do it to the best of my ability. Primarily I was working on Michael Jackson stuff. And that was where I really became disillusioned because in late 2009, um, Evan Chandler, who was the father of Michael Jackson's first accused, well, the father was the accuser. He was the guy that accused Michael Jackson of molesting his son, Jordan Chandler. Correct. And we're talking, the son was Jordan, correct? Jordan. Yeah. So Evan Chandler committed suicide and um, the son contacted me and asked me to put together like a dossier of information on the case uh, that would inform their reporting. And I was like, oh, well, this is fantastic because the Sun and every other tabloid newspaper gets this all wrong every single time they write about it. So I put together this really comprehensive like briefing pack 
where I went back to the original court documents and the original evidence and the interviews and all that kind of stuff and put together like a big list of these are all the things that you always get wrong and this is what the truth is and here's the source. So I spent all day doing that and sent it over to them. And then the next day I read what they'd published and they just ignored everything I'd sent them and they just published all the same bullshit that they got wrong every other time. And I was just like, oh man, you know, that's so disheartening. And Did you feel that you, they were influenced to do so? Or, I mean, is there a conspiracy behind that or? It's really hard to answer. I mean, I certainly there is a degree of agreement between major media outlets in the way that they cover Michael Jackson. I saw that firsthand in 2006. Uh, I made an audio documentary about this back in 2016. Um, I was at the World Music Awards in 2006. So Michael Jackson had been acquitted in 2005 in his trial and had gone to the Far East uh, or the Middle East. I forget where he went. He did, He went uh, I think he went to Dubai and Oman and then popped up in Japan and then Ireland, I think is the order in which it happened. But um, anyway, so then he, it was announced he was going to be appearing at the World Music Awards in London because the World Music Awards used to do an award called the Diamond Award. And you could only win the Diamond Award if you'd sold a hundred million albums. And Michael Jackson had won the Diamond Award many years ago, but he was about to become the only person in history to win the Diamond Award twice because he now had a single album which on its own had sold 100 million copies, which was Thriller. Um, and right, so, and you're talking about Jackson 5 would have been his first iteration? or um, So he had originally won the Diamond Award because of his combined album sales across all of his albums. Um, he'd sold a hundred million collectively, but then years later, Thriller just kept on selling and selling and selling. I mean, it just never stopped selling Thriller. So in 2006, Guinness World Records certified that Thriller on its own had now sold a hundred million. And so they gave him the Diamond Award again. And he was the first wow. person to ever get it for, for one album. I so, see. That, that's so interesting. I was, so I was there, I bought a ticket and I went. And um, he, there was a rumor that he was supposed to be performing and then it didn't sound true, to be honest, as someone that had been following Michael Jackson for years. He really did not like performing in his latter years. He did everything he could to get out of it. And um, so he came out and accepted the award and the reaction is, I just can't even put into words. It was, it, it was like brain mashing, the noise the crowd noise was so overwhelming. He gave an entire acceptance speech for about five minutes and you could not hear a word of his speech. All you could hear was screaming. And, it's like a beautiful um, concert. It really was. I've never seen, I've seen everyone, you know, I've seen Madonna, I've seen George Michael, I've, you know, you name them, I've seen them, right? I've seen Beyonce and I've never in my life seen anyone provoke that kind of reaction. And all he did was walk out on stage and collect an award. It was insane, the reaction that he got. And then he came right, right at the end of the show, he came out on stage and there was a choir performing We Are The World. And he sort of just, it, nobody could hear anything, including him. You could see him looking at the sound guys at the side of the stage. He couldn't hear anything. He had a microphone, but no, none of us could hear anything. Um, so he couldn't really sing because he couldn't hear anything. So he ended up just sort of wandering around the stage, like rent, reaching down, shaking people's hands, you know, high-fiving people or whatever. And then um, the music ended and he just stood on the stage for a few minutes and that was it. He was just stood there and people were just going insane. People, it was like the eighties. They were dragging people out of the crowd who had fainted. It was unbelievable. That and sounds the next amazing. day. It's like a Tom Jones concert too, right? <laughs> Well, they I didn't see her. anybody throwing knickers at him. But, <laughs> um, so the next day I go into university and one of my friends says to me, oh, you know, how was last night? They looked really sort of like morose and sort of like they felt sorry for me. They were like, mm -hmm. how was last night? And I'm telling them this whole story like, oh, my God, you know, you wouldn't believe it. The, 
in reaction was insane. You know, like you couldn't hear anything. And they were looking at me like I was in demented, right? I was thinking, well, this is weird. Why is everybody looking at me weird? So at lunchtime, I go into a news agent and I see all of the newspapers. And all of the newspapers are reporting that last night Michael Jackson was booed off the stage at the World Music Awards. And are you serious? I, booed I could, off the stage? I could not believe it. They literally were reporting not just that he got booed, but that he was booed off the stage. One of the newspapers wrote, I remember the phrase exactly, scuttled off stage to a chorus of boos. And I was just like, what the fuck? Because I was right there. I just, I didn't hear a single person booing. Not even what, I mean, the whole crowd were going insane. He Not only did he not get booed off the stage, he stood on the stage for several minutes with no music playing or anything, just sort of soaking up the applause. I could not believe it. So I learned that day, and I hate using the word conspiracy because it does make me sound mad, but all a conspiracy is is an agreement between parties. There, there clearly was an agreement among parties there because nobody who was present at that event could have come away under the impression that he was booed off stage because it's the literal opposite of what happened. He finished his sort of quasi-performance and then just stood there soaking up the adulation of the crowd for several minutes. So to suggest that he was booed off stage, for one person to report it would have been ridiculous. For them all to be reporting it, for every single newspaper to be reporting that he was booed off stage was terrifying. You know, I was a journalism student. I'd just gone into university the next day, back to my journalism studies. And then I go down to the news agent and I'm confronted with every newspaper just publishing the same propaganda. It was completely fabricated. And so I learned that day that there is something funny about the way the UK media certainly reports on Michael Jackson. There is a degree of agreement between parties to always take the most negative line, to work in tandem to publish fictitious stories. And, um, you know, I've since heard, I've been, you know, on and off working on Michael Jackson stuff for my whole career. And even just last year, I, I by complete fluke, I uh, met a lady who worked in a radio station as a receptionist. And um, when I was on the air, I was talking about Michael Jackson. Then I was I was leaving. The receptionist at the radio station stopped me and said, I was just listening to you on the air talking about Michael Jackson. I just had to share something with you. And she told me how she had used to work at a, a Rupert Murdoch owned newspaper in, in the UK, which doesn't exist anymore, called The Today. And she had been the archivist at The Today newspaper. So her job every day was to take the clippings from the previous day's paper and put them in the archive so that if any reporter needed them in future, they were accessible. And she was telling me how the reporters at the Today newspaper were under explicit instructions from the top to attack Michael Jackson at every available opportunity. And that they had been instructed that if there was no negative story about Michael Jackson, they had to make one up. And, um, is that like a memo or was that just a spoken? Well, thing? she was told it by one of the reporters because she was in the middle of trying to file the clippings on a Michael Jackson story one day. Right. And she realized that the story didn't make any sense. And she thought that maybe there was more to the story, which had accidentally not gone into the newspaper. And so she went off to find the journalist who'd written the story and say, where's the rest of the story? Because what you filed, what's appeared in print is like nonsensical garbage i can't even file this it doesn't make any sense and uh when she finally found the journalist he'd written the story he said no there is no rest of it it's the reason it doesn't make any sense is because it's made up we you know, we would we were instructed we've all been told you must attack michael jackson if there's nothing then you just make something up so that's what we did um what year did she reference this you was don't this was 88 she was very clear about the year because she remembered what the story was about it was a story about Michael Jackson being in London on the bad tour. And um, they were claiming that uh, thousands of fans had been crushed um, because he had failed to provide adequate security and safety measures. 
and the story was totally fabricated. Like Michael Jackson almost killed his fans. And um, right. and almost like intentionally or callously did so, right? Yeah, like, oh, you know, he's making all this money from this concert and he can't even be bothered to keep his fans safe sort of attitude. And uh, so she went off to find the journalist who'd written the story and he told her uh, it was fabricated. Just said outright, it's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. It's a fabricated story. None of us are happy with it, but we're all acting on orders. Um, and she said that had troubled her forever. You know, every time she saw something about Michael Jackson in the papers for the rest of her life, she always was thinking back to that moment and going, is this true or is this made up? Because I know that where I was working, they were just making it all up. Um, yeah, and she just felt moved to stop me on my way out of the radio station and uh, and tell me that story. That's amazing. Do you see that kind of bias or... I, I hate to say agenda driven. I don't know the correct terminology, but do you see that kind of collaboration or not conspiracy, conspiracy, but you know, everyone's on the same page about this, about any other subject besides outside of Michael Jackson, for example. No, I've never, and I've never come across any, you know, anybody that admits involvement either. You know, it's, um, it's a really weird phenomenon. But it is, it does seem to be like a Michael Jackson phenomenon. I don't know why. I don't know where it came from. I don't know why Murdoch or whoever it was at the Murdoch papers that was high enough to issue those so, sort of orders. I don't know why. I don't know what the motivation was, but it's. What was interesting for me is I was thinking 95, the second you talked about covering up stuff because of the Weinstein, the whole AJ Benza Weinstein piece, right? was like 95 mm -hmm. ever since. But that was 88, so that was seven years prior to that even. A.J. Benzer is the guy that admitted that Harvey Weinstein had him plant Michael Jackson stories, isn't he? Um, yeah, that's correct. To take the heat off of Weinstein. Yeah, I'm not sure on the time frame on that. I, re I know that he said that that happened. But um, to be honest, the media just seems to have it in for Michael Jackson from even the early 80s. You know, even in the early 80s, they were saying he's a freak he's transsexual you know he's um he's gay he's he's been castrated to keep his voice high he's must be swallowing female hormones you know blah 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 i mean a lot of a lot of it in the early days certainly in my opinion was racist it was racially motivated because you can see it in the double standards you know in uh like david bowie can dye his hair like clown red and then paint blue circles all over his face and, right. you know, wear a boob tube and he's a genius, but right. Michael Ziggy Jackson, Stardust was definitely a fluid character for sure. Right. Yeah. Like, let's not yeah. Get her. but like Michael Jackson wears some eyeliner and all of a sudden he's transsexual, you know, it, it was the double standards were insane. Um, when well, you, you can even back. probably make that same argument with Freddie Mercury up to the mid eighties, right? Like Freddie Mercury was flamboyant and whatnot. And they, you know, he was not revered as what he was in a way. Yeah. Yeah. They, they just seem to have it in for Michael Jackson and um, that he was American. I mean, could that have been the UK's bias on it? Uh, well, I don't know. I just don't know. Um, it came from somewhere and it's hard without getting people to go on the record to say what the motive was but certainly i feel comfortable saying that it happened and um i've spoken to enough people who were on the inside who saw it happening if you look um if you look back uh you can see you know you just look at the coverage and you can see what they were doing i mean it, there's so many sort of overt sort of racist tropes that i do think i i am i'm pretty convinced some of it was um was racial i mean they frequently associated him with sort of bestial behavior they frequently portrayed him as an as like an animal like an ape or you know there, there were lots of um anti-black tropes that were included in the reportage back then and even even down to you know even when they weren't trashing him, they wouldn't put him on the cover. You know, Rolling Stone wouldn't put him on the cover. MTV wouldn't put him on TV because he was black. Um, that was just the era they were dealing with. But it seemed to sort of hang over. And um, they got away with stuff and did stuff with Michael Jackson that they wouldn't get away with anywhere else. You know, 
calling him Wacko Jacko, right? That's a mental health slur. And a few years ago, there was, um, well, probably more than 10 years ago now, there was a, a boxer, a huge boxer in the UK called Frank Bruno, who had I a mental know, breakdown. You know well. Yeah, he's a heavyweight, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, he may have been the world champion, I forget. Well, I think he, he may uh, have, yes. He had a breakdown. He had mental health problems. And um, The Sun put on their front cover uh, a headline. Which I'm paraphrasing, but it was it was something like Bonkers Bruno hauled off to the nut house, something like that. And um, it, I mean, the outcry was enormous, absolutely enormous. And they actually had to recall the newspaper and put a new front page on it because the fury from like mental health campaigners and so on. Well, in today's climate, I certainly see the backlash. Um, Chris and I are in our mid between 45 and 50. So in our mid to late forties. And in that time, those, those phrases were not, uh, at, they were not seen as dangerous as they are, as we're seeing them as now, if that makes sense. I do. You know, I totally agree with you. But they, they, they still call Michael Jackson wacko jacko. Right. right. Like I, I totally years understand. After Bonkers Not defending Bruno. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, they get away with things with Michael Jackson that they can't get away with, with anyone else. It's just a, it's a strange, he's almost like a unique case. And, um, I don't know what it stems from. I don't know what, whose decision it is or how it all gets organized, but I witnessed it firsthand that day at the award ceremony. He was not booed off stage. You can go on YouTube right now. There's videos from all over the arena that night. People that were in the gods, people that were on the floor, people on the left side of the arena, people on the right, people in front of the stage, people up in the balconies. There is no video anywhere where you can hear a single person booing. It doesn't exist. And it's not only the concert, it's not only the acting together and, and all telling the same fake story. It's telling a fake story which can be disproved in five seconds, but they have the confidence that nobody is going to do that. Nobody is going to challenge their narrative on Michael Jackson because they know that everybody's in on it. I mean, that award ceremony was broadcasted on TV like a week later. He was not booed off stage. You could see it on TV. He wasn't booed off stage. Not one newspaper said, what the fuck was the deal last week when everybody was saying he was booed off stage? It's it's like an agreement, and it's so strange. And uh, I don't know how it gets organized or whatever, but, you know, I've seen it. And I see it to this day. You know, I see it in uh, in the way that Leaving Neverland is covered and Square One is not covered and so on. It's um, it, it's uh, it's like an over overwhelming agreement with between media organizations across nations. And um, I don't know how it began and I don't know how it sort of uh sustains itself but it is still happening right now since so uh, you brought up square one which we uh, we've interviewed danny Wu and and uh, Taj and uh jess garcia how did that how did you get asked to help with that so i uh, literally got an email from a guy i'd never heard of called danny Wu, uh who said can I do a telephone interview with you for um, a documentary I'm making? And I assumed wrongly, uh, I assumed it was a podcast because um, he wanted to do a telephone interview and uh, agreed, you know, just said, yeah. For, Cause I think I said to him, who else have you spoken to? That's the first question I always ask when somebody contacts me and says, I'm doing a Michael Jackson thing. I got approached last year by Amazon, but well, not by Amazon, but by someone that was making a documentary for Amazon. Um, and I said, who else have you spoken to? And they said, Mark Lester and Matt Fidesz. And I was like, well, I'm not talking to you then. Um, whereas when I spoke to Danny Wu and he told me the people he'd spoken to already, I thought, okay, well, this guy sounds like he's doing a decent job. So I just did two, we did two phone interviews, which were both about 40 minutes or an hour long. Um, and then forgot about it. And then the next thing I heard was, um, he had sort of edited my interview into a form of narration for the documentary. And, um, and he was inviting me to a premiere 
at the Chinese theater in Hollywood. Uh, and, you know, do you want to come to the premiere of the film? I was like, what film? You know, <laughs> I still was under the impression it was a podcast. Um, and so I ended up flying out to uh, Hollywood and, and attending the, the premiere at the Chinese theater, which was pretty nuts. So what did you think of Square One as a whole? I thought it was very good. Um, I, I mean, you know, uh, there's so much about that case, which you could, if you wanted to make like a four part mini series out of it. But I think Danny did a very good job at synthesizing the, uh, the information and telling it in a way that was, um, you know, when you get bogged down in a case, when you get, when you, it's almost like if you know a case too well, there are so many little avenues you can go down and it takes a real talent to take that information and boil it down in a way that makes sense to somebody that doesn't know the case as well as you do. And I'm guilty of that when I talk about the trial, the 2005 trial, because I'll start talking about one thing and then I'll go, oh, and that reminds me about this other witness. Wait till you hear about this. And you just go off on all these tangents and never come back to where you started. Um, I think Danny did a really good job of making it understandable to somebody that knows nothing about the case. And you can see that in the audience responses and um, and in the the success that it had. It became the number one Amazon documentary in the UK. It became the number one Amazon documentary in the US and it became the number one Amazon documentary in Canada at various times. And um, you don't become number one if people aren't recommending it to each other. So I think he must have, I, I thought he did when I was at the premiere, but I think people must agree that he's done a good job of, of explaining the case in a way that's understandable to people that are coming at it, not knowing much about it. And, um, and that's a real skill. Uh, we agree completely. And coming from my perspective, I wasn't a big Michael Jackson fan. Uh, but so I try to be objective about it. And I did watch Leaving Neverland and I did watch Square One and try to look at everything from every perspective. And it Taj made a really good point when we talked to him for almost three hours that the the it was almost like they were leaving Neverland was attacking his family and they didn't care about the consequences of what it does to Taj as a person and to the, all the remaining family members of Michael Jackson. Um, yeah. I mean, leaving Neverland is four hours long and to make a documentary that is four hours long and still only tell one side of the story takes a lot of effort. And so it was a concerted, it was a decision. And I think the funny thing about Dan Reed is that he changes his mind a lot. So if you listen to some of his interviews, he says, well, you know, we, we, I decided early on that I believed these guys and I just wanted to tell their story. And that was the story that I wanted to tell and blah, blah, blah. And then other times he's insisting that he fact checked rigorously and that it's objective journalism and blah 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 it, i mean he can't decide whether he was objective or not he changes his mind almost every time he gives an interview he was not objective he was not balanced he was not fair he was not impartial and he was not professional and um the documentary is riddled with information which is either untrue or is contested and where it's contested that is not demonstrated to the public that's watching uh, there are misleading statements in the documentary, such as they are allowed to make comments to the effect of it's not about the money. We're not doing this for money. Uh, we're doing this to be a voice for victims. That's not true. They filed their lawsuits under seal. You don't file your lawsuit under seal if you're trying to be a public voice for victims, because when you file under seal, you're doing it in secret. So what they actually did was filed lawsuits under seal, trying to elicit under the table payments from Michael Jackson's estate. And only when the estate said, we're not paying you, did they go public. And now they say, it's not about the money. We just want to be a voice for victims. You don't want to be a voice for victims if you're trying to get secret payments without the public finding out. There are all sorts of statements included in that documentary, which are not true and are not contested. And if he was interested in being impartial and factual, he would have contested he would have shown both sides and um 
in my opinion, it's a shoddy piece of work. Um, but it's shoddy in the right way for the establishment because the establishment hates Michael Jackson and they would rather you do a shoddy job that makes Michael Jackson look bad than do a good job that's even handed. And so he's he's played to the gallery. He's been rewarded for playing to the gallery, but it is a shoddy piece of work. And it was clearly designed to be one sided and to be an attack and he was as nasty as he could possibly be about the Jackson family. He accused them of being greedy. He accused them of only defending Michael Jackson because they wanted money from his estate, even though the overwhelming majority of Michael Jackson's relatives get nothing from his estate. So again, more lies, more deception, more dishonesty or poor research constantly conflates the family with the estate. It, he was so nasty about the family and Taj in particular, you know, and then quite unbelievably, posted a picture. I mean, he it, it's almost like you couldn't make it up. He posted a picture of Taj's brother and said it was Taj. So it's like, you know, and then he's, he's insisting he's a fantastic fact checker and he does his research properly and he can't even tell the difference between Taj and his brother. I mean, you couldn't make it up. It wow. was just One of the three T brothers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he posted a, t a picture of TJ. And oh, was okay. Taj, you know, yeah. <laughs> pathetic. That's crazy. So obviously we, we've, we're, we were exposed to the Michael Jackson thing through Jess Garcia. And then we had the privilege of speaking with Taj, like you said, as well as Danny and yourself. Um, but there's so much interesting about yourself as a journalist, because you cover more than that. And I'd love to transition into the unfinished podcast i believe it's unfinished the lost boys of shoeberry is that correct almost it's unfinished shoeberry's lost boys shoeberry's lost boys my apologies right. um yeah tell us a little bit about how that started and i'd love to hear just a general kind of a synopsis of it we'll definitely post the link on our on our show notes because it was it was definitely worth a listen i mean the the, the things that you uncovered was just amazing well, um, so as in 2011, I joined uh, a newspaper group called the Yellow Advertiser, which was run by Tyndall Newspapers. So that, uh, that was my first um, PAYE journalism gig where I was not freelance anymore. And um, the it was a newspaper series that covered London and Essex. And um, in Essex is uh, a seaside town called Southend-on-Sea. And one day I was sitting in the office... Well, it goes back before that. So in late 2014, um, amidst, we, in the UK, we had a sort of a mini Me Too movement, which preceded the Harvey Weinstein Me Too movement. And it happened because there was a DJ, a BBC DJ called uh, Jimmy Savile, who died. And after he died, hundreds, literally hundreds of people made allegations that he had abused them as children or as young women. And um, the outcry over the fact that Jimmy Savile had got away with it for so long, because it turned out that multiple people at various times over decades had reported Jimmy Savile to different police forces. And in each case, the police felt that there was insufficient evidence to bring a prosecution. But this, there was a, a critical failure by the police because none of these police forces knew that the other forces had had similar complaints. So if the police had been acting across the UK in a joined up way, then maybe they could have brought their cases together and said it was yeah. evidence of a pattern and, and had him prosecuted. What year was that um, again? Well, I mean, he was reported over over decades. I can't remember when the first one was, was made, but he definitely was reported in the 90s and then again in the noughties. But I okay. think he may have been reported earlier than that. Right. And I'm just curious with like, you know, we had 9-11 here in the United States and our our sharing of information between, uh, you know, uh, I guess, justice departments, agencies. agencies thank you. Uh, between agencies has increased, obviously, because of that. Right. Because you, you have the same pieces of information and you're not sharing it with each other. Yeah. I And I don't because I thought that there was a police national computer before this all happened. But somehow the police forces did not consult one another or did not consult the right records. And in each case, no further action was taken. And when this became apparent, 
there was outcry and it prompted a, a sort of a Me Too movement in the UK. But the Me Too movement in the UK that came out of Savile revolved primarily around people making child abuse allegations as opposed to women making sexual harassment and rape and sexual assault allegations. And so for a couple of years, historic cases were enormous news. The Jimmy Savile thing, it provoked like a tidal wave of complaints. All sorts of other celebrities got accused. A number of them went on trial. Some of them, the cases fell apart and were quite ridiculous. In other cases, they got convicted. And um, amidst all of this, I was going one day on a slow news day. I decided to go through the accounts information that's just been published for my local, what would be like the equivalent of City Hall, Essex County Council. Somebody had demanded some of their accounts information under freedom of information. And uh, I thought, oh, well, I've got nothing else to do. I'll go through it. And I was looking through a spreadsheet of every um, compensation payment, which the council had authorized in the last year long period. And I was scrolling down. It was all pretty boring. And then I just found one that said 70,000 pounds alleged abuse. And I thought, wow, okay. That's a story. That's big. And that's, you know, that was late 2014, right? Late 2014. And okay. um, I kept scrolling. And then there was another one. And then there was another one. And in total, I think there were 10 or 11 abuse payments um, by this All one the same council. Amount? Or were they diff varying pr sizes? All different sizes. Uh, the 70 grand was the biggest one. Um, and some of them turned out to be the same cases. So it was like multiple installments in different cases. Um, but they were listed as separate payments in this document I was looking at. And so I just asked some questions. I just went to the press office and said, I've got a list of questions here about these payments um, that I need answered. You know, number one, what was the gender of the complainant in each case? Number two, why is it a council issue? Were they in a foster home? Were they in a children's home? Was it abuse that occurred in a school? Uh, what's the deal? Why is the council responsible here? Uh, number three, how old were they at the time? Et cetera, et cetera. And one of the questions I asked, which was very important, was in each one of these cases, did the council report the alleged crime to the police? Because you know that the answer to that question is always going to be no, because they're always trying to cover up abuse complaints. Because as soon as it goes to the police, there's a chance it'll end up in a criminal court. And if it ends up in a criminal court, there's a high probability that that will end up getting reported on, which just equals catastrophic PR for the uh, the organization. So they never, almost never report these cases to the police. And when you find out that they haven't done that, that's really bad practice on their part. Anyway, so... And you generally know that answer before you even ask that question. Oh, yeah. They, I mean... <laughs> Once, <laughs> you're like giving them up blue rope. moon that they actually yeah, you're giving them rope to hang themselves basically <laughs> yeah so um the press office comes back and says we're not answering your questions we've submitted them on your behalf as a freedom of information request and then the answer came back on christmas eve 2014 uh i was sat at my desk we always came in on christmas eve for a half day and generally did no work um you know, people would like bring, everybody would bring in a different type of food. You know, someone would bring in like sandwiches, someone would do sausage rolls, cake, whatever. And we would have like a little party in the office and people that played instruments would bring them in and have a jam session. It, it was just a fun day, Christmas Eve. But I was in early, so I switched my computer on to just to see if anything had happened overnight. And I had an email from uh, Essex Council Freedom of Information. And it said, we're not answering a single one of your questions because to answer any of your questions could identify the victims which was considering one of my questions was yes or no in each case did you report it to the police on what planet could you argue that that identifies the victim to answer yes or no to that question it's a ludicrous assertion so i rang the press office and just said look th this is outrageous and i'm gonna have to make a complaint if this isn't fixed because this is unsustainable, it's indefensible. And um, I sat and had a conversation with the news editor after hanging up the phone. 
and we just decided first paper of 2015 is going on the front page. Council refuses to answer questions about child abuse payments that it's making out of court. And um, so we ran these stories basically saying the council is covering up child abuse. You know, we got child abuse charities to comment and um, and then, you know, we're sort of hoping in the background that my appeal would would be fruitful. But in the meantime, I'm just sat at my desk one day. It was a snowy day. The office was freezing cold. I remember my I was so cold that my knuckles hurt. And because um, the heating never worked in that building, it was ridiculous. So I was sat there. I didn't take my scarf or coat off all day in the office. I must have looked like Fagin. And um, and I get a phone call from reception that says there's somebody in reception that wants to talk to you. And I go, oh, God, because almost always if somebody walks into reception, then they're a nutter. But um, I went down and it was a guy called Robin who was um, in his mid 70s. He was a retired health service manager. And he said, are you the guy that wrote the stories about the Essex Council child abuse payments? I said, yeah. And he said, I've got to tell you something. So I took him into the boardroom and he just told me this story about how when he was the district psychologist for South End. So he was the, the head of the entire psychology department for South End on Sea. His department had been asked to help strategize the official response to um, the discovery of a paedophile ring, which had dozens of victims. And the victims were, as you can imagine, badly psychologically damaged and were experiencing all sorts of issues ranging from self-harm to suicide attempts to wanton criminality to uh, sexuality was corrupted and they were starting to abuse younger children and all sorts of stuff was going on. And um, he said, we started working on this case, and then it all got covered up. It was you know, outrageous what happened. You know, we, we knew that there was this big ring. They told us there was a big ring. They told us about all these victims. And all of a sudden, it was like the whole thing just got shut down. So uh, it may have nothing to do with these payments that you're writing about, but maybe you're the right person to tell if you're interested in this kind of story. And that was where it all began. And um, a year later, I was sat in the office of the police commissioner for... Essex and he was announcing that as a result of what we'd found out they were reopening the case of this 25 year old pedophile ring investigation and, and that was your interview in the bonus episode right that was the guy but that wasn't the interview so okay uh, that was yeah the guy. okay yeah Nick Alston and he's now uh, a director of the National Crime Agency so he's actually even more important than he was then <laughs> he's uh, so it was really nice of him to him? pardon do you still have a relationship with him of some sort or? Yeah, well, I, I rang him up when I was doing the podcast and said, are you willing to do an interview? Uh, he said, let me listen to the series and then I'll let you know. And um, he listened to the series and said, yeah, sure. So we, we recorded an interview as a bonus episode uh, where he was sort of reflecting on, you know, us having brought the case to him and, and what he did about it and what he hoped would happen as a result and what actually happened. And he's, um, he's a really interesting guy, you know, and he's, as I say, he's a national, he's, he's the direct, uh, a director of the national crime agency now. Um, and on that ninth episode, the bonus episode of the podcast, he's used it to call for the government to change the way that it's publishing and allowing access to records on police and court cases in the UK. And that's uh, quite a, a bold thing for him to do. Um, so he's uh, opening it, making it transparency or more transparency. He wants more transparency. I mean, he can't do it on that's his great. own, but yeah, because yeah. in the UK, our system is very different than your system. So if you listen to a series like in the dark, uh, which is a fantastic American true crime podcast series, their season two was all about um, a guy called Curtis Flowers who kept being prosecuted over and over again for a murder that he quite clearly, or a multiple murder that he clearly did not commit. And, um, you know, in, in In the Dark, they just like, they're going, oh, well, we wanted to find out what happened in this case. So we just went down to the police archive and looked through all their files, right? In the in England, you can't do that. But it, 
you cannot access a police file. You can't access a court file. Nothing. I mean, it's all secret. It's all off limits. You could try and fight in court to get access. You could try, but it would take a lot of money and a lot of time and you would not be guaranteed success. Whereas in America, you can just make a phone call. State, right? Like the state of the UK, like the UK government is doing that, right? For Is it for privacy reasons or? I'm sure I mean, that would be the excuse they would use. But the excuse, uh, right. I mean, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous the amount of secrecy in the UK. I remember right. seeing Carl Bernstein. To the podcast, and, to, and in listening to the podcast, hearing all of those roadblocks you went through just to get some additional information here and there was pretty astonishing. I have submitted so many information requests in that case and have several outstanding still, some of which uh, I'm still at the first appeal stage, some of which I have reported bodies to the information commissioner. It's disgraceful, the UK system. So our Freedom of Information Act has a clause within it which says that they can refuse to publish information if it might upset somebody. So I'm investigating violent paedophiles who abused hundreds of children over their lives, Some, many of whom are, are completely destroyed as human beings, homeless, drug addicted, mentally ill, many of them attempted suicide, some succeeded, some died of drug overdoses. The web of damage which emanates from these guys, thousands and thousands of people, these people's parents, their siblings, their friends, their aunts and uncles and grandparents, have all had their lives destroyed by what these men did to these kids. But if I want to find out about the crimes that these men committed, then I'm not allowed because it might upset their sister. It might upset their mum. It might upset their next door neighbor who they were quite friendly with. It's a disgrace. Our system is a disgrace. Our, our freedom of information system is ludicrous and pathetic and disgraceful. And it provides a cover for criminals, violent, depraved criminals at the expense of victims who have a right to know about these guys and have a right to transparency because, yeah. you know, there's still, there are still unanswered questions and it's still not really explained why these guys were allowed to get away with what they did. They were effectively allowed to get away with it. They were looking at life sentences and they ended up with three and four years and they'd already served a year waiting for their trial. And in the UK, you only serve half your sentence before they let you out. So one of those guys did six months for six years, months? six months. Cause he, so he got a three year sentence. He'd done a year on remand waiting for his trial. That meant that to get to the halfway point, he had six months left. Right. So six he went to court and pleaded guilty to abusing dozens of children. Six months. I mean, you know, and then, and we're not allowed to know about that guy because it might upset his great aunt. You know, it's just a disgrace. Um, it is disgraceful in the way that it's it's not like it's hearsay. These are things that happened, right? They had a trial. There was an there was guilty. an and there was a con and there was a confession. Yeah, they pleaded guilty. They right. pleaded guilty to reduce charges, but it was clearly stated in court that there were dozens of victims. And they it's not slanderous when it's truth. I, I that that yeah. astonishes me. And all we want to know is why. Why did you give them this deal? These guys have come to court and admitted to the violent abuse of dozens of children. That's only in that case. These guys had That's multiple convictions good. anyway, right? And, and they've probably admitted to it because they know they're getting off in some way, right? They know they have something. They pleaded guilty at the last minute for, on a plea deal. So... They were facing conspiracy charges and buggery charges. Buggery would now, under the law now, it would be charged as rape. But at that time, it was called buggery. And between the conspiracy charges and the buggery charges, they were looking at 15 years to life. And all of a sudden, they come to court on the day of their trial. The conspiracy charge is taken off the indictment. The buggery charges are all downgraded to attempted buggery. And then they plead guilty. So they did a deal to plead guilty to these reduced charges. The prosecutors said that they had done it to spare the boys from having to testify, but none of the boys were consulted. They weren't asked. 
So, and then when they came to sentencing, the court smeared all those boys as prostitutes. Some of these boys were eight, nine, ten years old, and the court was told these boys were prostitutes who instigated their own abuse, and so they weren't damaged by what was done to them. So how how can how can you have not consent for one thing but consent to be a prostitute? Exactly. How can right? like that, that's consent? just yeah. That's like an oberos, right? That's like the snake that eats his own tail. That makes no that makes zero logical sense. It was ridiculous and the judge then sentenced on the basis that the damage to the boys was perhaps limited. Um and so they got these weak feeble sentences. And supposedly this was all done in the boy's interest. How is it in the boy's interest to have their abusers released after six months and in the meantime call them all prostitutes who wanted to be raped? How is that in their interest? The, mm -hmm. And when I found one of these boys, he was furious. He didn't even know this had happened. Nobody ever told him. All he knew was that the guys went to jail. Nobody had ever told him about the plea deal. Nobody had ever told him about what they said about the boys in court. He was furious. and. Um, all we want to know is why. We know that one of them was a police informant. We found that out as part of our investigation. But what? Right. And that was what Mr. King, on? right? That was Mr. King. No, that, Dennis King. Right. That was yeah. De Derek King? Dennis. Dennis, Dennis. Dennis King. Yeah, Dennis King. And But we don't know what they were informing on because what could you be informing on that's important enough to merit downgrading the sentence for his own offenses, which were so depraved and so serious? it's hard to imagine what he could have been informing on that would merit that reduction in sentence. And that's what we want to know. That's what we're trying to find out through all of these information requests to CPS, which is the prosecution service, to the police, to the probation service, to the courts, to the National Police Chiefs Council. We have all of these open requests to the Ministry of Justice, the prison service, None of them will give us the files, apart from the uh, the prison service. The prison service did give us the files that survived, but they didn't answer the question. But they, they just keep refusing, and they're all now using the same excuse. And the excuse is the Freedom of Information Act says that if it's conceivable that in theory releasing this information might upset one person, we don't have to give it to you. It's just <laughs> disgraceful. And it reminds me of some current policies that are in place where the intent initially was good, but now it's gotten to the point where it's ridiculous, right? It's like a backwards policy. It actually hurts the initial cause that you're trying to fight for in the first place. I think it's the sort of thing that's buried in the act and is used as a last resort when they're really scrambling for a reason not to give something to you. Because, and even that's a good then... Point. There's supposed to be a public interest balance. So they are supposed to say, in the, you know, if we balance the potential upset to this one person against the public interest and the public interest wins, then we have to give you the information. There is no argument to be made that the public interest doesn't win in this case. No argument. And yet they always tell us that we failed the public interest test. And what it is, is they know that if we were, if we had the means to take it to a court case, we would win. Hands down, we would win. But you've got to have the means to do that. You've got to have the money to be able to take them to court and get it overturned. And there are not many media organizations now that would have the money to do that, unless you're like CNN or, you know, the BBC or someone. Um, and so they know that even the, even though they're wrong and they're using this exemption in a, an arrogant and almost like a sneering, smirking way, there's nothing we can do about it. And that's the most infuriating thing, because they're not just smirking at me. They're smirking at every child that these men molested. They're smirking at their mothers. They're smirking at the mothers and fathers of men who are now dead because they've shot themselves or hanged themselves. That's, that's unbelievable. This, you know, yeah, and it's, it's so frustrating stuff. because because in the podcast you even mentioned like these are pedophiles. This isn't like Whitey Bulger like in the United States where these are, you know, gangster people who chose this life of crime. 
this is pedophiles that affects children directly. How could you have a police informant be a pedophile or be an absolved pedophile or be absolved for being a pedophile? Yeah, exactly. You know, if the using an informant is all fine and dandy, if you're using somebody who is down the pecking order and is going to give you somebody more important, you know, if you if you bring in a small time drug dealer and you say, we'll let you off if you tell us who the kingpin is, that makes sense. But to take somebody who is on an industrial scale, pimping small children out to men, what can he be informing on that is more depraved and more important Vile, than that? right? Yeah. yeah. What could he possibly... Now, we do have one possible theory, which is that through my investigation, we actually connected this guy, Dennis King, to a gang of pedophiles that murdered, well, they didn't, they killed a number of children. Um, they were not convicted of murder. They were convicted of manslaughter. The, this uh, gang, they were called the Dirty Dozen. They were led by a guy called Sidney Cook. They killed three boys. I mean, it was, so they argued that it was not murder. It was accidental. It happened in the course, in the commission of another act. And, um, yeah, the byproduct of rape. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so we connected King to the Dirty Dozen, and we do know that King is a police informant because we have that document, and we do know that the two cases were ongoing at the same time. So it is a theory, and it's an unproven theory, and I wouldn't want to suggest that it's fact, but it's possible that King informed on another pedophile gang that were actually killing children. That would be the only world in which that plea deal makes sense. Now, my How... suspicion is that that's not what happened, because if it is, then they would just tell us, because it would actually make them look less shit for having given the deal, right? So if they were to go, oh, well, yeah, we did, and it's not ideal, but look who he gave us. Because he's dead now, so it doesn't matter. There's no reason to keep protecting him as a, as a, an informant. But the fact that they won't do that, and they keep trying to cover it up, suggests that actually it's not that, and that there was something else going on. But um, it's, it remains a, a potential solution, a potential explanation. Is it a thought, possibly, that... And once again, we we question everything. We're not on board with every conspiracy, but we do question things. Uh, Chris and I do. Um, could it possibly be that they penciled him in as police informant where he just was connected or had dirt on other people, say, like an Epsteinian kind of control? I believe that is also possible because as the series, as the podcast goes into. Uh, so the kids, the first kids come forward. And then the social services department in Essex um, asks three charities to start counselling the first 14 victims that are known of. And those boys start naming other boys who start naming other boys and the web of victims gets bigger and bigger. And something else that happens during these counselling sessions is the charities all realise that different boys are naming a particular police officer who was regularly at Dennis King's flat. Now, it could be, if Dennis King is an informant, that there is a good reason for a police officer to be constantly going in and out of his flat, although you would think that a police officer might be a little bit concerned at the fact that somebody who already has about 20 convictions for child molesting would have boys in his flat every time that he'd go there. Um... So maybe that's not the explanation. So maybe. Well, plus, was... plus, if he was an informant, I don't know if you'd meet at the person's house, considering he's yeah, yeah, he'd be informing on people that probably have been there. You know. <laughs> yeah, it would not <laughs> seem like a sensible. There, the, it sounds like very shallow water we're treading. It's here. a safety <laughs> issue for sure. Yeah, so it does suggest that maybe there was another reason for that officer to be constantly going there. But interestingly, none of the boys ever said that this officer did anything to them but they all said that he was in and out of the flat regularly. Um, now, the other thing that we know is that when the case was first cracked, when they first arrested King and Tanner, a detective spoke anonymously to 
a tabloid newspaper called uh, The Mirror, and said that they believed that there were high-powered people connected to the ring, including businessmen and civil servants. So, again, was King just connected, and did they call him an informant, but that was just a an excuse for giving him leniency? Who knows? I mean, it's, these are the questions that are unanswered, and there's all sorts of theories that we can speculate and debate. Is, but is there a way to see, find these answers, or, or does someone have to start talking for these things to get uncovered? More. Someone needs to start talking or um, or they need to start giving us the paperwork that we're asking for. You know, I mean, again, the guy is dead, you know, so it doesn't matter even if because there there are rules around covert. They call them CHIS, covert human in, investigate. Uh, what is it? Covert human intelligence source, CHIS. Yeah, there are rules around protecting your CHIS, your informant. But if they're dead, they don't need to be protected anymore. Um, and yet, instead of just going, okay, because if they were to just tell us the information, the story would be published the next week, and then we would never have a reason to write about it again. That would be it. The story would be right. over. For the rest of all eternity, there would be no reason for anybody to be writing about Dennis King and Essex Police anymore. So why don't they just give us the information? You know, it's... It, and they're fighting tooth and nail... And using such sort of harebrained, pathetic reasons not to give us the files that it really does. They're just buying every minute that they can, it seems like. Yeah, it, it's laughable, the excuses that they're using. You know, we can't tell you about this guy in case it upsets his cousin. You know, I mean, it's pathetic. I mean, this guy was estranged from his family anyway for right. various, you know, because he was a serial pedophile. pedophile. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like, I'm not like, laughing at the situation here, but it's like that's what he was. He was he, he had almost forty yeah. sexual convictions, I think, at the time that he died, if yeah. not more. And his with the po recent... in the podcast, you mentioned twenty seven prior to I think ninety five, and then another thirteen. So I I counted forty just from what you shared. Yeah, and these included uh, molesting children, photographing it, and then decorating his flat with the photographs. It included possessing images of people having sex with corpses. I mean, this was a sick guy. You know, this was not somebody that you invite to the family barbecue. So it, it seems like such a pathetic reason to keep using to withhold the files. It really does make you wonder what is in those files. Is it cock up or is it conspiracy? Is it that they, just the way that they dealt with this guy was such a cock up that they don't want the embarrassment of admitting it, or is it that there was something nefarious going on? It seems it has to be one of those two things. And, um, you know, I mean, if I win the lottery next week, then I'll take them to court and I'll find out. But in the <laughs> meantime, I just have to keep plugging away through all the free avenues that are available to me. Charles, it seems obvious from listening to the podcast and talking to you today, what, how high up do you think this goes? It's, it seems like there's multiple people at high levels pulling strings to to get Dennis King and several other people horribly reduced sentences for monstrous crimes. It's a, an interesting question that I can't give an answer to really because I don't know. I mean, what I can say is that I have noticed a change across the spectrum in the way that my information requests are being dealt with. And they are all now coming back with the same excuse for not giving us the information. And it's this thing that you can't get around this. It might upset somebody. Um, it might upset somebody and you failed the public interest test. They're all now parroting the same line. And it seems very coincidental because a couple of years ago, nobody had ever used that to as an excuse. And now every time I submit, a request on King to any government body, I get the same response. We can't give you that because it might upset someone. So I, I do suspect that there is some sort of uh, communication going on between government departments as to how to get out of publishing the files. Um, beyond that, I can't really say, you know, because it just would be speculation. Yeah, so, of course. I understand. Yeah, I just don't know.
And you're you're a professional journalist. You're not on a witch, wild witch hunt here. These you're following where the trail leads you. You're not making a trail yourself. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, it's um, I it came to me in my day job, and it's it's no longer really my day job just because I don't work. The yellow advertiser where I was working at the time closed down, um, as is explained in the final episode of the series, and uh, my new job. Um, I made the podcast, but it's not really my patch anymore. Uh, so it's a bit of a, like a passion project, I guess, for me, but I have to remain objective and also uh, try not to get too involved um, and too sort of bogged down with it because it's one of the, it's, it's one of those, again, like when I was talking earlier about a trial, how if you know a trial too well, there are so many avenues you can go down and tangents that it can be really difficult to lose any sort of narrative center. Um, and with this case, I mean, this is the kind of thing that, you know, like a ripperologist, you could end up spending your whole life just obsessively investigating and never getting anywhere. So I have to be careful not to <laughs> like get too uh, obsessed with it. So I kind of, but like just the other day I got an email. healthy distancing, right? Yeah. You know, pick it up every now and then. And, but just and, the other day, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Just the other day I got an email. Um, I'm trying to remember what day it was. I think it was Wednesday. It was the day before new year's Eve. I think that was Wednesday. So I got an email from a guy who said, Hi, I've just listened to your podcast and uh, I know some of the people in the podcast, some of the police officers. Um, and I think I've got some information that would be useful to you. And I ended up ringing this guy and interviewing him for two hours. And so I got some great new info out of that guy, but I'm not sure what to do with it because the podcast is finished. So um, unless there's any major breakthroughs, I think the story is pretty much done, but it's more of a principle for me that, I don't think they should be allowed to get away with keep withholding these documents on these flimsy bases. So I do keep just, I do just keep fighting with them over these documents. I'm not really doing much else on the story anymore, but I do maintain the battle <laughs> over the, uh, well, over all the records because I do just think that's so egregious, you know, to the, the way they're sort of smirking in everybody's faces with these, it's, it reminds me of like when somebody, shows up somewhere and they've got two black eyes and their lips split open and somebody says what happened and they go I walked into a door it's just like <laughs> sort of like arrogant right. sort of like smirking i i just hate it and um yeah. and so i i kind of don't want to let them off the hook on on that front yeah i mean there is a greater fight here for for just transparency in general from the state or government or other organization or systems uh chris and i very much look behind the curtain of systems, right? And the control that they have and, and how they kind of control us in that way. You know, and it's not, it's not to fight powers. It's just to be aware of them so we can navigate them better. Yeah. And if something could come out of this, even if it was not a solution to the Shubury case, but it was a commitment to being more open with uh, documents in terms of police and court files that would be great, you know, and to have uh, Nick Alston at the National Crime Agency in our corner on that one is really useful. Um, that is amazing. We need more than Nick Alston, but Nick Alston is a good start. That's excellent. Charles, you said on the podcast that there was a total of 83 victims. Is that correct? So there's no definitive total because, uh, I mean, even when Victim 6 emerged, uh, who appears in the sixth episode of the series. Right, right. He gave us names. He gave us a list of names that he knew of people that have been involved with King and Tanner. And about half of them were on the list and half of them were not. So he gave us new names. Um, so the way the, oh. the list was created was that uh, these charities were brought in to counsel the initial, the initial 14 victims. So they start counseling the victims. And of course, they start naming other people saying, oh, well, I was there with Johnny, and then, uh, you know, Johnny showed up one day with Barry. Obviously, these are all fake names. But um, so so the charity started writing down all these names. So, like, oh, my God, these 14 boys are saying 
there are other boys. And then they start referring these other boys to the authorities. And then those boys are interviewed and then they start naming other boys. And so what you find is that each little gang it gets bigger and bigger. And it even turned out there have been waves. This had been running for a while. So there was an older generation of boys that had passed through these men's hands and were now 19, 20. And we were on the second or third generation by the time that it was discovered. Um, so through the work that the charities did, they compiled a list and they estimated, based on all that they knew, that there were about 80 victims. I think the list... There was a list that was created and it was given to social services that was in about mid-1990. And at that point, there were about 63 names on it, something like that. Um, but they estimated there were about 80, you know, by the time they finished working on the case. But then, as I say, Victim 6 gave us even more names, gave us new names. So um, who knows how many? And that's just in this one case, because King in particular, he was convicted over and over and over again and this is just the one he was convicted you know th these these are the kids that he was convicted of on this occasion mm -hmm. but he had like 10 similar cases throughout his life um so yeah i mean the number that they abused in total is colossal and when you use the term pedophile ring how many offenders are we talking about Again, that's it's it's hard to quantify. So the boys started giving addresses that they've been taken to to be abused by other men, and some of those were home addresses. Some of them were public toilet blocks. They were um, bars and pubs and hotels, and they, in many cases, didn't know the address because you know they were kids in the back of a car, but they knew that they were taken near this particular landmark or they recognized that they were in a particular town uh we know that the boys were taken to towns and villages all over essex we know that they were taken to parts of london we know that some were taken as far as brighton some were taken up north uh, and the number of other abusers is just completely unknown and the idea of a pedophile ring as well in a way, it's almost sort of um, a myth. That's what it was called. It was called by the authorities at the time, the Shoebury Sex Ring. So Shoebury was a town within South End on Sea uh, where King lived. And they called it the Sex Ring because they knew that King and Tanner were sharing these boys with, with other men. But in reality, it's not really a ring because to call it a ring sort of suggests it's almost like gives the impression of a top-down organized idea uh, like a structure but there is no real structure so all it is is pedophiles who know each other and are networking and they're just sharing boys with each other and a lot of it grew up in prison because um, when sex offenders are imprisoned they generally are kept on a separate wing than the other offenders because they're especially child sex offenders they're treated because, very poorly by the in other inmates from what exactly. i understand they're in enormous danger from the other it's inmates. like it's like a bad crime i don't i don't know yeah. what the right way to call it but yeah if you're a gangster who killed another gangster then there's kudos attached to that if you're somebody that abuses children there is no kudos attached unless you're on the sex offender wing where it, you, you know, people might look up to the best sex offender, but within the context of the prison, it, you're like the scum. So all the other offenders want to kill you, basically. So they keep the child sex offenders all together, which is a good idea for making sure they don't get murdered. But it's a bad idea because it means that they all get to network. So they all swap contact details. They get to know each other. Then when they're on the outside, they can find each other. And so what it created, much like exists on the Internet now, there was no Internet back then, but on the Internet now, pedophiles network. But back then they network, they had to try to network in a safe way that didn't involve the, you know, the, the Internet didn't exist. Right. So right. the best way to do that was go to prison, meet a lot of other pedophiles. And then when you're on the outside, you can form links. See, and if you went down over and over again, 
then you made more and more contacts. So all that was happening was King and Tanner were sharing boys with other paedophiles that they had met through this kind of system, this of underground paedophile network. So it's not a ring in the sense, see, Dennis King was described, King and Tanner were described in court as the ringleaders. But really, they were grooming kids and they were charging other paedophiles to use them. But to use the phrase ring, it just sort of suggests, to call them the ringleaders of a ring, it suggests that they're like the bosses and then it's an organized top-down structure, but it's not. It's just, they're just sharing boys with all their paedophile mates. And there equally would have been paedophiles in other towns who would have been charging King and Tanner to use their boys. It's So it's not really a structure. It's just that you have identified as investigators this particular small area of a national network. Um, and so that's why the contacts stretched all over the country, you know, um, because they were just sharing boys with with other paedophiles that they knew all over the place. That's just, uh, it still astonishes me. I mean, it's crazy because like when, when I look at how, when Chris asked how deep does it go or how high does it go, right? The powers that be the two that we're aware of in the United States, the two big ones are Weinstein with me too. And all the Hollywood elites who are all famous and have a lot of money. And then you've got the Epstein one, which he's, pictured with two presidents of the United States in two different pictures. You know, it's pretty interesting because when I look at the Shoeberry piece, I, I ask that same question, how high, like who really had control here? How powerful were these people at the top? Yeah. And it's, um, you know, the Epstein one is interesting because it's, um, you know, I've watched the, I've watched the Netflix thing and I've seen some other stuff about Epstein and um, I find it, you know, the internet community, the Epstein internet people, I find them really interesting because it's like, oh, Epstein had his photograph taken with someone. So that means they must be a pedophile. And you go, uh, uh, hang on, you know, <laughs> right. I don't, don't think it does. I don't think. Right. It's not correl correlation yeah. does not equal causation here. Yeah, exactly. You know, just, I mean. Dennis King probably had lots of friends that were not pedophiles that he met down the pub or, you know, he would have had relatives that he would have had his pictures taken with at various times in his life or whatever. You know, not everybody Dennis King met was a pedophile. So the Epstein thing, I, you know, clearly he was involved in some kind of sex trafficking. I don't think that's disputed. Um, but I get a little bit like uneasy when I start seeing some of the loose connections that you see on the internet, like, Oh, somebody flew on his plane once. So they're obviously in on it. Uh, yeah. And no. I want to be clear that uh, Chris <laughs> and I come from uh, what, what is that? What is it from common sense? The, the law of common sense. So we're, we're not jumping to any conclusion in that sense, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I don't know it inside out the Epstein case uh, is it Epstein or Epstein. It's, it's all same the same thing. to us. Okay. <laughs> One correlation that I found about Epstein and the Shoeberry case, listening to your podcast, was that the recruitment, because Epstein had girls recruit other girls. And you mentioned in the podcast, please correct me that if I'm wrong, there were boys recruiting other boys. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. And uh, in a way, I suppose probably the same with Epstein. It was a way to save yourself. Um. And that was the way they framed it. You know, if you want, if you don't want us to do you tonight, go and get someone else, you know, and, um, Oh, there was okay. One that they kind of, uh, they called him the artful Dodger. And, yeah. um, uh, so because he, you know, in the Oliver twist story, he's shows up in London and this other kid, this other sort of young homeless kid comes and finds him the artful Dodger and, sings him a song in the film, you know, in the book, he doesn't sing him a song, but, um, and then says, I know a great place you can come to where you'll be safe and takes him back to Fagin. And of course there's a whole discourse now about whether Fagin was a, a pedophile. Um, I can't remember what he used to call. Did he used to call Oliver my pretty? He used to call him something, my pretty or my something like that precious or something like that. Um, but anyway, so the Artful Dodger lures Oliver back to Fagin's lair 
where there are all these other boys. And that, so they came to call this other kid the Artful Dodger because they knew so, he admitted that he had gone out and recruited other boys. So but, the recruitment is really to hold someone else in front of the bus so you don't take the hit, basically. Yeah, that... and what it turned out also then was that although they called this one guy the Artful Dodger, there a lot of them became the Artful Dodger because they all wanted to save themselves. So it was it, initially when they started uncovering the story, this one guy seemed like they called him the Dodger. But the more they found out, they realized that's how the web got bigger and bigger because they just were trying to bring other boys in to so that there was less chance that they would be the one that ended up in the bedroom that night. Right, it's kind of so, like a reverse pyramid scheme in a way. It's like all yeah. the kids at the bottom are the ones who are going to be, you know, abused first. Yes. You know, quote unquote, fresh meat or whatever you want to call that for, yeah. you know, for predators like these guys are. I mean, there were even boys who introduced their own younger siblings, you know, which is just so sad. Um, that was also true with Epstein. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, is that in the Netflix yep. thing? Yes, sir. Absolutely correct. There was a sister yeah. who introduced a sister, and, the, and and her story is absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Was it The Artist? Was she The Artist? Yes, correct, sir. Yeah, yep. yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a terribly sad and depressing story. And it's one that, you know, not one that you would choose to spend, I think, now six years working on um just because it gets you down so much but now you're in it you just don't want to leave it till it's finished because these poor people it wasn't just the victims it was the whistleblowers the whistleblowers you know the the charity workers and the health workers who were working with the victims they had their careers destroyed because they started raising concerns and complaints about the way this case was being handled, they were dismissed as insane. They were called conspiracy theorists. There were orchestrated top-down efforts to stop them from getting further employment. They were trashed to other employers, uh, which was proved in one case. One of these, one lady who's in the show, um, she... Uh, I'm trying to think if I named her in the show. I did, Jenny. So one of the ladies that's in the show, Jenny Grinstead, she um, she gathered evidence um, with her union and filed a case against Essex Council. She got evidence from like 10 witnesses, including members of staff at Essex Council who said that the bosses at Essex Council had issued instructions to smear Jenny and stop her from getting any further work in the county because she kept raising complaints about the way this case was being handled. And she won. She won her case, and the council had to apologize. It had to syndicate a memo of apology to all of its staff. <laughs> so she won. That's amazing. Answer. But, you know, there was she was blacklisted by Essex Council because she kept raising concerns about this case. And so, you know, it's not just the victims, although, of course, the victims are the biggest losers in the whole situation, but the, the whistleblowers also suffered terrible consequences just for trying to help the victims and so there's a lot of people that you're trying to get closure for but i just become less and less uh optimistic about whether that closure is going to come right you know it's really interesting too about that is um i just lost my train of thought for a second but uh you're talking about, oh for jenny getting that information is like she won this case that's an amazing precedence for future uh, cases as well, is it not? Yeah, well, I don't think it was a court case. I think it was like a dispute with the council uh, through her okay. union. So I don't think it's a legal precedent, but I think the evidence was so... Uh, I think she probably would have taken them to court if they had not been able to sort it out between themselves. And it took two years. Um, but she did get it sorted. Uh, by having her union enter into a dispute um, with the council and present all of this evidence, all of these witness statements from people saying, you know, I was instructed, she's never to work here again, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, she was really brave to take them on and uh, good on her. 
What, what about yourself? Did you experience any threats or did you just more have administrative uh, pushback? Lots of administrative pushback. Um, I, at one point, received a telephone call from a friendly person at Essex Police on my mobile saying, from this point on, you need to assume that every call that comes into your newsroom is being listened to. Um, I did have some other issues, but I... You know, it was no, I couldn't definitively attribute them to the case, to the Shubri case, but there were some weird things that started happening to me in terms of people who um, suddenly appeared in my life, were suddenly around all the time, out of nowhere, and asking me a lot of questions, which made me uncomfortable. Um, now, Victim 6, it's not in the podcast, and I... I there's so much that's not in the podcast because you know I worked on this for five years, and I had to try and carve this story down into eight half-hour episodes for the podcast. So there's so much that's not in there. But victim six had a break-in, um, and the person came in through the window, and the footprints led to his um, internet hub his modem thing, you know, whatever you call it, your Wi-Fi box. Yeah. The person had come into his home, walked to his Wi-Fi box, taken the card out of the back that had the Wi-Fi code on it, and then left. And wow. um, and he called the police and reported it. But that was, I mean, who does that? Who breaks into your house and steals your Wi-Fi code and then leaves? Right, um, that's it. That like the only thing, right? There was money in the apartment that was not touched. There were right. all, jewelry, all sorts of stuff. They came in, took the Wi-Fi password, and left. Um, I mean, that's creepy, you know. So there were things that happened, and I mean, it could be that just a deranged person broke into his house and and stole his Wi-Fi code. That he could be completely unconnected. I'm not saying that that's definitively connected, but. It seems highly it's unlikely. Suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the, this is the thing. Chris, Chris and I question everything. We, we never definitively will tell you X equals Y or X plus Y equals Z. But that these things happen in the same time does raise questions. It's very curious to know that these things happened. Yeah. And, uh, and Robin um, had a, a drone then that kept ho the same like two weeks period that this break-in occurred, Robin, one of our whistleblowers, had um, a drone yep. flying The first up. whistleblower, right? Robin was the first guy, yeah, the NHS right. worker that came in. Yeah, he had a drone flying over his house over and over again. Um, and then the police, when the police showed up at Victim 6's house um, to talk to him about the burglary, they started asking him loads of questions about Robin. Um, even though it was, you know, I mean, Robin's like nearly 80. He couldn't climb through some, you know, someone's <laughs> window and steal their Wi-Fi. But besides which, I mean, what on earth would the motive? And, so, and that was very suspicious that the only thing they were interested in talking to victim six about was Robin. Um, there was all sorts of weirdness that was going on. And some of it could be incompetence or just, you know, stupidity or cock up or you know, one dunderheaded officer or something. But, and then there was the, you know, the uh, review, the official review into the case where the police just didn't interview anyone. We gave them all the names and all the documents. And then for years afterwards, I'm tracking all these people down myself and saying, oh, what did you tell the police when they did the review? They go, what review? What police? You know, we gave them your name, you know. Right. It so reminds me of uh, Corey... It reminds yeah. me of the Corey Feldman where he's like, I gave them the names. I gave them the names. They kept going another direction, right? Yeah. I mean, that was really, I mean, that's, that did not get the press that it deserved. Corey Feldman. So yeah, Corey Feldman was interviewed in 93 or 94 by police who were investigating the Geordie Chandler case. And he told them, Michael Jackson never touched me. And I don't believe Michael Jackson's a pedophile. 
And the reason I don't believe it is because I have been abused by paedophiles in Hollywood. And I don't believe Michael Jackson's a paedophile. He's never done anything to suggest that he is. But here are the names of the people that did abuse me. And um, and he gave them the names and they said, yeah, well, we're not interested in them. We're, we're only interested in Michael Jackson. Right. And right. so that's bad in and of itself. You've got a, a victim disclosing to the police giving the names of abusers and being ignored. That is bad. What's even worse is that years later, when Corey Feldman told that story publicly, the police department denied it. They said that he's made that up. That's not true. He didn't give us any names. And then right. somebody leaked the tape recording of his police interview to the media, and it proved that the police were lying. He right. did say it, and he did give them the names. So not only did they not act on his information, they then years later smeared him as a liar and accused him of making it up. This And this is the same police force that Dan Reed, the director of Leaving Neverland, um, he gave an interview a while ago where he said, oh yeah, as part of my rigorous fact-checking process, I interviewed some of the police that worked on the Michael Jackson case and they all thought he was guilty. So that was good enough for me. It's like, this is this is the same police force, the same corrupt police force that refused to investigate Corey Feldman's abuse allegations and then smeared him as a liar. I mean, it's outrageous. You know, this guy, Reed, just is brain melting. Absolutely. Yeah, chaps your hide for sure. And I understand the frustration because you've covered that so long as well but i mean going back to shoeberry you've you've been recognized for some nominations for some awards is that correct uh yeah so um we've been shortlisted three times at the british journalism awards and commended once uh most recently a couple of months ago we were shortlisted for the podcast um we were shortlisted for the poor foot award but a private eye um uh now let me remember the others we've been shortlisted for and won a number of society of editors awards i got a weekly reporter of the year and i came runner up in the same category three times we got weekly newspaper campaign of the year we got the news media associations making a difference award and we won Channel 4 and ITV's uh, Ray Fitzwalter Award for Investigative Journalism. So we've won quite a stack of awards for the Shubury case, which is really, um, you know, really lovely. And uh, it's quite funny because the lady, uh, I won it, I won the Fitzwalter from Channel 4. The lady that gave it to me was Dorothy Byrne. Um, and she's actually the lady that commissioned Leaving Neverland. Wow. Wow. That's a odd connection yeah <laughs> how did how awkward was that me how awkward well, was that exchange this was, was pre-leaving neverland so i won that award oh, in, oh uh, okay in uh april 2018 i have a picture okay. of her giving me the award and i would share it but at the time i was really quite ill with a big kidney stone um oh. which i eventually a couple of months later i had to have a surgery to get rid of and immediately before that award ceremony i had a chronic attack of kidney stone pain and it was so bad that i was like shaking and sweating it was like in 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 uh like ice cold sweats oh. and i had to go straight to the award ceremony and i just looked like a tramp in all these pictures like my hair is looks like i've just got out of a shower i mean it, the pictures are hideous but I do have a picture of, uh, of Dorothy Byrne giving me the award. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting one. And she was perfectly nice and everything, you know. And I mean, wow. she didn't she didn't make the TV show; she just commissioned it. But she, unfortunately, she has defended it uh, repeatedly since it came out. Charles, what are the next? What do you have coming up? What are your next projects? <sighs> a good question so i um uh i'm helping taj as and when i can on his documentary um okay. and i was hired around this time last year to work on a documentary by a guy called larry nimmer 
So Larry Nimmer worked on the Michael Jackson trial. He um, He's a, a videographer and he was hired by the defense to... Um, to film Neverland. So the defense wanted to take the jurors to Neverland and show them around so they could see all the locations that were being described in the case. And the judge said no. So the defense um, hired Larry Nimmer to go and film Neverland. And one of the most important things he filmed was the alarm test because the prosecution were claiming that um, that Gavin Arvizo's brother had walked in on multiple occasions and seen Michael Jackson molesting his brother. Um, and so they got Larry Nimmer to film an alarm test where, uh, cause Michael Jackson, he was extremely paranoid about security because he used to get letters like threatening to kill his kids and stuff. And so he had alarms all over his house and he had combination locks on everybody's bedrooms. And, um, and he had an alarm so that if anybody came into his bedroom, it sounded. Because uh, one time he came back from a tour or somewhere and came into his bedroom. And then a fan jumped out of his closet had somehow got into Neverland and got into his closet. Um, so he had alarms everywhere and including one on the door to his bedroom. Right. So when you walked into Michael Jackson's bedroom, it set off like a siren, like wah, wah. So. They, I mean, and the prosecution's case was that this kid had walked into Michael Jackson's bedroom twice and seen his brother being molested. It's like, how could that possibly have happened? Look at this alarm. So anyway, Larry Nimmer was the guy that uh, filmed it. Uh, anyway, so he was making a, a documentary for the uh, 15th anniversary of the verdicts in the Michael Jackson trial. Supposed to come out last June, but it all got delayed due to COVID. So I worked on that. Um all manner of day-to-day -day newspaper journalism, a lot of COVID reporting, a lot of... Uh, I just did a project on um, falling police uh, results, you know, solved rates in London. I just did a, a series of stories on... Um, As in, like, uh, criminal cl like, criminal cases solved? Yes, exactly, solved rates. So yes, the percentage so the percentage of criminal cases is falling, of... of Solve solved criminal case, cases yeah really really badly so like the percentage of rape and sexual assault cases which is resulting in in a charge in five years has dropped from 22 percent to five percent or four wow. percent i mean it's catastrophic um is, it, is there a, is there any kind of reasoning for that there isn't really i mean we did ask the police like why but they just come out with all sorts of like Orwellian gobbledygook, you know, like, oh, maybe it's because we changed the way we recorded whether a crime is solved or not. It's like, oh, give us a break, you know, one of old cobblers. So there's, um, you know, we do ask them, but we rarely get anything from them that amounts to something sensible. Um, Interesting. I just did a series of stories on drug dealing in Hertfordshire, which is a county just outside London. So I'm working on all sorts of stuff. Well, we're about um, two hours in. <laughs> Welcome to the time warp, Charles, because yes. that felt like 10 minutes to me. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to share with our audience or with anyone else before we call it a day? Uh, well, I probably should just give the link to the podcast. So, Absolutely. Yes, and please. please give all your particulars, and we will also post all of that in our show notes. But please talk, share us with us all that. So I'm on uh, Twitter at C.E. Thompson, which is spelt. T H O M S O N. And uh, the podcast is available at www.podfollow.com forward slash unfinished dash one. Unfortunately, forward slash unfinished was already gone. So unfinished dash one. But you can get it through um, wherever you normally get podcasts from, whether it's Spotify or iTunes or some other tech. Which yeah, we beer Googled, I just beer Googled unfinished Shoeberry's Lost Boys podcast and it came right up under Apple. So I just clicked on the first one. Yeah, I'm not a techie person. So I <laughs> always get like too deep in the list and then forget all the rest. But it's definitely on Spotify and Apple podcast. Podbean, is that one? That sounds familiar. That is one. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's We're on actually, we actually use Podbean. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's on that. I think it's on all of them. I think wherever you go for podcasts, you've got to find it. It's called Unfinished. 
my season is season two, Shubri's Lost Boys. Uh, season one was made by my colleague Tom and um, investigated three unsolved killings of young women in uh, the east of England. So that's worth a listen as well. Excellent. We okay. will share that as well. Well, thank you again for, for coming on. And if if there is something from this new information that you garnered and wanted to put something together, maybe we can talk about working that out and you feel free to reach out to us. Sure. Yeah. I'll let you know. And um, uh, I feel like I've gone off on sort of weird tangents and that this has all been a bit uh, fluid and directionless. So apologies for that. But hopefully that's what we're designed to be. That's what happens to us all the time. It's it's conversation. You know, that's we went the direction that it went. You know, we we like to offer just be open like that. So I'm very happy with how the direction the conversation went, you know, as fluid as it went, as it was. Okay, well, that's a relief then. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> we approve. Yeah, we're less structured than than most, but uh, we hope to. We try to reel it back, but we were going to call our show tangents because we just kept <laughs> going on them. But uh, thank you again for joining us. We're grateful for all of that information you shared. Once again, it's unfinished Shoeberry's Lost Boys podcast, and once again, we will share all your particulars in our in our show notes when we release the the episode. Oh, and we should probably say Square One as well. Square One on Amazon Prime. What's it? Square is it one Amazon, as well. Amazon, it's not called Amazon Prime, is it called Amazon Yes, Amazon Videos Prime. Or something? Yeah. Oh, okay. Amazon right. Prime Video, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Chris, uh, you always close us out, so feel free to close us out, sir. Uh, be excellent to each other and party on, dudes. Take care, everybody. Mm-hmm.